Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Renowned Podcast. My name is Mark Schultz, and we also have Allison Hager. And we are your co creators and co hosts for the show. Renowned Podcast is a podcast for the curious. We dust off the commonplace and we look for shiny new relevance as we challenge ourselves and hopefully all of you to think a bit more critically about the objects that surround us. How do they echo humanity's past, reflect the present, or maybe even foreshadow the future? Allison, would you like to remind everyone what our noun of the week is? Yes, for this episode, our noun is appendix, A-P-P-E-N-D-I-X. Appendix. Nice. And if you recall, audience, it may sound like we're about to use it in a sentence, but we're going to use it in so many sentences. <laughs> <laughs> that echoes back to Allison's very first episode with me where we said that. So many sentences. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I guess with that, uh, shall we roll them? Let's roll them. All right. Five. Four. So you are I up. Like you're I'm on a you're on a roll. Yeah, oh. this uh, this year. <laughs> All right, let me get All my right. timer set up for you. Yes, 15 of seconds on the clock for your just the hits. Okay. And go. An appendix is something left hanging at the end of a work in case the reader needs or desires more context. But does the evolution of storytelling mean the end of the appendix? Ooh, I'm very intrigued in this. And uh, <laughs> once again, we went very different, different. directions. This is Excellent. fantastic. Okay, you had four <laughs> seconds left, by the way. You're getting you're oh, getting really good at nailing those. Faster, something. Yeah. <laughs> Bigger, right, better, I stronger. Have, right, go, go. <laughs> All right, I have tell 15 me when. seconds on for you and hit it. I have a new respect for the appendix after the research we've done for this episode. It's small, it's dismissed as useless, it's misunderstood, and yet it can bring down the mightiest of us. Nice. Two seconds left. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I kind of figured maybe one of us would take the organ. One would take something right. like the appendix. literature piece Excellent. of it. Oh, good. Because right. in, in my setup, I touch on, obviously, that's one of the definitions. Uh, so excellent. A little tag team uh, action here. Okay. Jumping down yon rabbit hole. Per the OED. Bum, 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 as always. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that, with the appendix, that which is attached as if by being hung on appendage, noun, which is now of really more restricted use, apparently, than thinking of it as something hung on an appendage. It's largely, um, you know, the organ, as we're going to talk about, with Allison, for sure, uh, or the collection of attached information at the end of a document, as I'm going to talk about. Um, the organ, just to touch on it, the organ's complete name is vermiform appendix. Uh, vermiform meaning the form stop of Stop stealing my thunder. Oh, sorry. Okay, then I'll I'm stop there. Kidding. No, no, no. Go, go, go. I'm what, kidding. Oh, okay. Vermis, no. <laughs> which is worm or worm-like. And just to take a second there, ver, V-E-R, is being the root, meaning to turn or to bend, worm-like. So if there's anyone out there uh, who speaks French, I speak a bit of French, ver is, is still means worm in French. So when you take ver for worm-like and then make it vermiform, you just hear how we're using um, older Latin uh, roots to describe things in medicine. Okay, so... The word itself overall comes from the Latin verb appendere, which comes from pendere. So if you picture appendere, you've got an AP there, let's cut that out. You're left with pendere, which means to hang. We can go even farther though uh, and break and look at those two pieces. So ap, AP is a prefix we use that really is AD, ad. Um, the AP comes from that. So the ad means toward or in relation to. So this whole thing, appendere, is in relation to pend, that root word meaning hang, um, which means, which is why you sort of, even when I started with the OED um, definition, it's something that is hung on. It's, it's not just hanging, it's sort of something that is yeah. proactively hung, really, when you think about it. Uh, and then just to cover off on the IX suffix, that is related uh, in early English to the IC or the ICS suffix, 
And sometimes it's um, also uh, the feminine noun declension in Latin. So I'm not, we're not getting into declensions, um, but if you, you think of how verbs are conjugated, if that puts anyone into some horrific reminders of maybe middle school Spanish or French or German or whatever you're taking. Um, I, I being the language geek and, and loving to, to speak French and been learning Italian, a lot of conjugations going on. Um, but declensions are very similar. They are different forms that nouns take. So you can think of conjugations for verbs and declensions for nouns. Um, so there are several obsolete meanings that riff on this idea of just like a related offshoot um, or even like a dependency. Um, you'll see in some of the, the OED when it, it's, it's citing older uses, they might say that someone's appendage or um, could be their child. It could be somebody that that relies on them. They're sort of, you know, an appendage. Um, but you know, now, uh, again, it's, it's really been scaled back to really the, the two uses that apparently we're both going to be talking about one or the other today. Uh, so let's th take a look at the use that perhaps those of us in the business world would have immediately thought of. I, I think last episode when we got this word, Allison, potentially, I don't want to misspeak, but I feel like you went right to the organ in your head. And I, for some reason, probably because I was just getting off of work or something and probably had just drafted an appendix in a PowerPoint document, um, thought immediately of the, the end of the document. Excuse me. So let's jump in to that, the end of a document or a presentation. So first things first, trivia. It may seem disconnected, but I'll, I'll get there why I'm asking this question. <laughs> Okay. What is the oldest known form of storytelling? Is it A, oh. oral storytelling, B, written storytelling, or C, visual storytelling, or D, none of the above? Oh, I mean, oral you threw none of the above in, but I got to go with oral because we had right. an oral tradition. Exactly. Um, oral storytelling. So at first, I like the way this question um, is phrased because you might think visual because that it could be pictorial or something like that, but. And it um, could be pre-speech, right? But exactly. that, that yeah, was yeah, yeah. something I thought. But, but I think it kind of went the, the other way. Um, oral is considered predating writing of, of sort of any kind, I believe, um, and is believed to have started in prehistoric times, which makes it difficult really to pinpoint a time exactly. Um, but in ancient cultures, oral storytelling is thought to have served multiple purposes. A vehicle for teaching moral lessons, explaining the natural world as well as they could, perhaps, uh, and instilling cultural values. Indoctrination, grooming, if you will. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, actually, get me started because we're about to then transition into something that I normally wouldn't talk about, but I think it's an interesting to look at the very first recorded usage of appendix in. English. So um, anyone who used the OED, Alice and I, I think use it quite often in the show, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. I thought, as opposed to other episodes, I haven't taken a deep dive into what one of the first recorded uh, uses is and to give a little bit more context on who wrote it and what's the larger piece and where it's quoted, et cetera, et cetera. So figured I'd do that today. The surprise, and audience, this will be a surprise to Allison as well, is it's steeped in religious use. Probably not a surprise, <sighs> right? Those who were literate back at the time were part of the church because it was a consolidation of power, frankly. But anyway, um, and this is so, fantastic. <laughs> Buckle up, people, because this is just one of Mark's favorite subjects. Favorite, favorite subject. Um, so Hugh Latimer potentially known to some folks, but it was an English Protestant who advanced the cause of the Reformation in England. So he was born in Thurkeston, uh, Leicestershire, England, in about 1485, and was an ordained priest uh, by, five, by 1510. So Latimer was a strong supporter of King Henry VIII's break with the Roman Catholic Church. So he was known for his wit, apparently his passion, his directness in sermons. And so one of his sermons um, is where this first recorded use of the word appendix actually shows up, which I just think is sort of huh. interesting. It's literally yeah. thrown in there. But uh, I just, again, love our process in the show because 
I'm looking up something quote unquote mundane as appendix and kind of finding this interesting context and background. So his sermons were widely popular and helped to spread the Protestant message throughout England. Uh, Latimer was burned at the stake in 1555 oh, for heresy. Uh, he was burned alive, uh, burned at the stake by Queen Mary I of England. Mary was a devout Roman Catholic who wanted to restore Catholicism to England. So if anyone remembers that back and forth time period and how crazy disruptive um, Henry VIII's whole split with the church was, and then the backlash with Mary, et cetera. Um, he was charged with denying the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and denying the authority of the Pope and criticizing the Catholic church. So by all means, burn somebody alive. Anyway, um, Latimer defended his beliefs in his trial and was found guilty and sentenced to death. Eesh. And so his execution is held up as a major event in the English Reformation. I think a lot of people think of, you know, the German Reformation and so on. I grew up, I am no longer, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I am a very uh, staunch atheist, but I was raised early on as Lutheran. So, of course, one of the, you know, the very first split um, with Catholicism. So, uh, Latimer's martyrdom made him a martyr for the Protestant cause, and his memory actually is still honored by a wide swath of Protestants to this very day. So I thought I would read um, an excerpt from what is known as, um, it's called the second sermon, but I think at the time, which is interesting, the language geek in me, it, it means the seventh. Um, I think SEC must have referred to seventh at the time and, and not second. Don't know the background on that, but uh, so this was recorded uh, in the, the 1500s. So I had some fun going through this, if anyone you know has read the older English from that time, the spellings and no doubt the pronunciations are very different. But what I loved was that it didn't take a lot of tinkering for me to actually update the spellings and I believe everything's accurate. And therefore the uh, this will read as fairly modern sounding English. And this is just a few paragraphs uh, and I'm saving the appendix for last, but just a little bit of interesting context as he was starting. Uh, and now you know the background of what was happening in the country and what he was standing for and the vicious sort of opposition that clearly was coming later while he was burned at the stake. Even as in times past, all men, which were honestly bent to the promoting of virtue and learning, found means that the works of worthy orators, of famous and renowned philosophers, should be by ye, benefit of publishing, redeemed from the tyranny of oblivion, to the great and high profit of countries, of commonwealths, of empires, and of assemblies of men. Likewise, ought we to fetch our precedent from these men and suffer no worthy monument to perish, whereby any good may grow, either to the more godly administration of politics and civil affairs, or else to the better establishment of Christian judgment. So, Hopefully I'm reading that with some clarity, a little test of my acting background, but really calling for, as in the past, to, to save those documents and important things that, that should stand the test of time. Numa Popilius, who was inaugurated and created King of the Romans next after Romulus, was far more careful and busier in grounding of idolatrous religion as upon rites, ceremonies, sacrifices, and superstitions than we are in promoting of Christian religion to the advancement of the glory due to the omnipotent majesty of God himself. Allison's cringing that I'm even able to say that with a straight face. Who hath revealed and uttered his word unto us by his prophets? And last of all, by his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, whereby he hath confirmed our conscience and blah, blah, blah. We don't need that part. But um, you can see he's really saying if Rome could do it and maintain their documents and so on in this really astute way, why do we suck at that, basically? <laughs> and I don't mean to talk to anybody. If you're clearly understanding what I'm reading, I probably don't need to paraphrase, but it's fun. And then the last paragraph. This Numa instituted an archbishop for the preserving of the commentaries, containing the solemnities of their religion with many other appendices united to the office of the high bishop. And what do we? Well, we have suppressed. We have wrestled with fire and sore, not only to deface the writings of such learned men as have painfully travailed to publish God's word, but also we have stirred every stone and sought all devilish devices to detain yet some word of God itself from his people. 
So ranting on and on about why can't we save stuff? Why can't we have nice things, basically, uh, and, and, and maintain? So I think it's great that part of his passionate claim to document things really calls on appendices, the, the word that we're using to, to, to store additional and relevant information, right? And, and setting up the, the, the preserving of the commentaries, as he called it, done by this, uh, by Numa back in Rome, uh, had all these appendices, right? This is a massive tome of, of information and they better do that. And the news burned at the stake later. Anyway, uh, so I paused there, just uh, interesting and, uh, I don't know, not to put you on the spot, Allison, any just like reaction? I, I know it's a little bit different for me to, to do a reading like that, but. No, it's fantastic. But here's what I was thinking while you were reading it. You did do such a good job, but I was thinking it would be so easy for someone to just like cut out you doing that out of context. And like, you know, this is how, this is how rumors start. And then suddenly it's like Mark Schultz, Mark Schultz has like re-embraced Zealous. religion. And oh he's exactly, exactly, that's what I was thinking. Especially in our post-truth. Cause AI, it was so convincing. World. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so trivia question two, as we move along, what is the oldest known material used in making a book? Is it a papyrus? B, clay tablets, C, vellum, or D, paper? I mean, like, but define book. So, I mean, I'm going to go with papyrus because that uh, was the first, like, thing. But, like, they did write on clay tablets before that, but it wouldn't have been, like, a whole book. So, so I'm going to go with papyrus. Yeah, that, okay. that's, I kind of think, where I was, yeah, where I was going here, papyrus. Exactly. Correct. I know. Uh, I know. I feel like I'm doing softball questions this week, but it's all good. I'm um, just brilliant. I don't know what you're yeah, talking about. But, uh, that is true, though. Uh, so correct answer is A, papyrus. Papyrus is a type of paper that was made from the papyrus plant. It, I always want to say papyrus, but papyrus, I think. Mm. It's probably papyrus, actually. Now I need to look it up. Anyone go look it up and tell us on social media. <laughs> giving you homework. It was the first type of paper to be used for books, and it was used in Egypt from around 3000 BC to around uh, 100 Common Era. Okay, so this next section, perhaps a little dry, but I want to list uh, something that I found. So when I was taking these different approaches and, and perspectives on appendix, right? Honestly, trying to challenge myself to say to take something that is literally just a part of a document or a book and make it a little bit interesting and, and teach myself something about it that I, you know, wouldn't have known, or certainly, hopefully, other people wouldn't have known. And I started to think, I don't really know all the parts of the book, like what is considered a book. So I'm going to list these. Go with me here. It's about 30 things, but I'm just going to read them. Some of them are only one word each. What? Um, but it's, it's really quick. I'm not going to describe them. I'll just list them off. Um, and you'll kind of see where an appendix would naturally fall in sort of an expected publishing order. Okay, so this is uh, from the Author Learning Center. And the front matter are elements of an order of a book. So as I read through these, kind of see if you can picture the last time you like read through a formal book, as you're flipping through all of it from start to finish, those things you might have bypassed, those things you might not have known the name of, et cetera, et cetera. And this would be like if an author had everything stacked to the gills in here. So front matter is the first section. I'll read that. Then there's the text elements, like your actual body of the, the book. And then there's what they call the back matter. Front matter, half title page, series title page or front piece, the title page, copyright page, dedication, if you have those authors that have dedications, an epigraph, a table of contents, a list of illustrations, a list of tables. Then you would have a foreword. Then you would have a preface. And so the difference there, right, is sometimes the foreword and the preface, the foreword are generally not be written by the same author. The preface generally is. Acknowledgements, introduction, abbreviations. <laughs> so just make sure, right? If somebody really went to town with this, whoo, this is why if you're anything like me, I'm like, I'm just, I'm like taking a whole inch of the front of the book and being like, I don't need to read this. But then I feel guilty and like I should if I want to understand the context and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so those are all the, the front matter pieces. Text elements in order. Another half title page, in case you forgot after all that other stuff. What the hell are you reading? Uh, two, introduction or prologue. 
Three, your text divisions, everything we know, parts, chapters, sections. Four, a conclusion or epilogue. And then five, an afterword. You probably go to town on what the subtle differences are between those things. Did you know there were? Look it up. Uh, then the back matter. Appendices, woo, or an appendix. Appendices being the plural. Um, so now we kind of understand where they are. It would be the, generally the first thing past the actual body of the text in your back matter, but it's the first of about, about 11 different things that can be in the <laughs> back matter. So appendix, then you would have a chronology that could be in the front matter if they wanted, end notes, the glossary, a bibliography of references, a list of contributors, illustration credits, indexes, a colophon, errata, it's my whole life is errata, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and then 11, about the author or biblia, bibli bibliographical note about the author. So I just put that in there. I realize it's, it's a little dry, but I kind of like just understanding where an appendix really should fall. Because it dawned on me as I was reading through this, I was like, where is, generally is it supposed to go? Is it really the first thing? I thought it was the very last thing, uh, but it is not. And why that is actually is the appendix. This becomes relevant for where I go next. The appendix is really meant to be that supporting and relevant information. So although things like the foreword, a uh, preface might give you <clears throat> an author or a secondary, uh, a third party's view of the work, about the work, the appendix really is extensions of the work or relevant backup material that could have actually probably been worked into the main text right. if needed, right? Uh, so it's it's a little bit different, um, sort of relevant, you know, super relevant context that, that, that really could be activated and brought in if needed, as I said. So we're going to talk a little bit about that after trivia three. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What technology superimposes a computer generated image on a user's view of the real world, thus providing a composite view. Where are you going with this? Uh, is it A, virtual reality? Is it B, augmented reality? Is it C, mixed reality? Or is it D, none of the above? Augmented reality. Correct, you're three for three. Yes. Three. Uh, augmented reality. So here's, I love your question. Where are you going with this? Here's why an appendix made me think of <laughs> augmented reality. And where I go with this is, is a little bit bizarre. Um, it occurred to me because it was this kind of interesting connection to some things that I'm working on in my real life, uh, in, my, in my career, in my job, at my job. So an appendix makes me think of augmented reality because it's it's a way to access relevant and related supporting information to deepen experience. Whereas I see that. you might have right an, an appendix yeah. was later. I'm thinking about it in terms of say you were reading a book and you knew that something in the appendix, like say it said see appendix, and you flip to you take the time to flip to the appendix, get that additional information, and come back. There's a moment where you're deciding whether or not that is pulling you out of the experience of the narrative or the story or what you're doing, or if it's augmenting it truly, augmented reality, uh, and helping you understand something or dive deeper if you're passionate about what it is you're experiencing or reading or so on. So I kind of saw augmented reality as a quick digital visual way, um, visual but still textual often, to flip back and forth Instantly, instead of flipping through a big book, <laughs> you're in goggles and you're tapping on something or on your phone and you're tapping on something and it's it's more easily accessible. So just to chat a little bit about augmented reality, uh, we talked a little bit about it in another episode, but I don't like to assume that audience members um, go episode to episode. So just a little bit about it. Augmented reality is a technology that, as I mentioned in the question, superimposes this computer-generated uh, computer image on a user's view of the real world. Now that can be either through like Oculus, right? The goggles that are that are out there or even just on your phone, if you're in Google Maps or something like that, or in apps certainly that you can use the camera on your phone and it will show you what the camera is seeing, but it will superimpose augmented reality. AR, 
augmented reality, can be used to enhance the user's experience of the real world um, with additional information, directions, labels, even 3D models and things that, that hang in the space. Anybody, any Snapchat users will know that, um, certainly. Or, or actually, at this point, it's so common in e-shopping where you can click and view something in your space. I think Amazon does that a lot, actually. Now. So AR is becoming increasingly popular with applications in a variety of industries, including gaming, education, manufacturing, and healthcare. Some of the most popular AR applications include Pokemon Go, Google Maps, as I mentioned, and Snapchat, as I mentioned. Uh, but AR is still developing technology and has the potential to revolutionize the way we interact with the world around us. So a few more details. Um, it's contrasted with virtual reality, which creates a completely artificial environment. Um, so if it's easy for, for folks who don't think about this technology very often and might get confused VR versus AR, virtual reality really is that complete artificial world. Really nothing that you're seeing in that space is, is really there. Um, AR can be implemented using a variety of devices, as I mentioned, smartphones, tablets, head-mounted displays, and it's becoming more and more affordable. When it first came out, it was kind of breaking the back, but now it's getting to be kind of everywhere. Um, you can see like cardboard, simple pieces, um, goggles and things that you can, you can have. So here's the, just the last bit of, of where I wanted to go with this. <clears throat> when you're talking about the evolution of narrative, right? We started this whole conversation today with talking about oral history. And there is a, in my view, fascinating way of looking at the evolution, but also the return to something that was possible in oral storytelling, mm. which was, it was interactive. And if you wanted relevant information, you could ask the person you were talking with, right? Whoever was telling the story, you could interact, you, you could ask them. Um, I don't know, I'm picturing a bunch of children gathered around the campfire in prehistoric times. If they wanted to know what that princess looked like, the person telling the story could give that context, right? They could make it up. Um, or if it was a historical, like who was the chieftain and what did they look like, they could actually give real information uh, if it was recorded in the oral history. So there's a way of thinking about the history of and evolution of narration is kind of coming full circle to a degree. When you had the creation of writing itself, even writing before, you know, the press or, you know, printing presses or things like that, that just compounded it. But the, once, the moment you had someone write something down, you no longer had a two-way conversation. You had a one-way conversation. And then things like the printing press, film, all of that just made it larger scale reach of one-way conversations. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a, an assumption on what might be relevant information what might be supporting information was kind of concatenated, combined, and put into things like an appendix, where you are making a guess, perhaps, or an, you know, a best assumption on what, what might be needed or, or relevant. The advent of gaming started a return to interactivity that now we're seeing grow more and more and more, where you had a bit of a two-way, maybe not as much as you'd like, but it was, if you think back to Atari, things like that, you might not think of them as narration, but there was a story, there's an, an experience taking place, and suddenly you didn't have someone passively, so to speak, just reading it. It wasn't a one-way broadcast, if you will. There was a two-way interaction, and it's gotten much more complex. Now you have games this day. Um, Elden Ring, if anybody knows that, is a huge one out there. You really have AI-powered adaptation and distinct uh, trees, logic trees and, and of experience where narratives are being told and experienced very collaboratively where you could have maybe not the same outcome as the person playing the game in the house next to you. 
it, it's it's very unique and different, right? Um, so that's where I kind of see like this return of the relevant information. If you're in a game like Elden Ring or another one is Grand Theft Auto V, you know, where uh, another one is Detroit, Become Human, all of these things, like the choices you make in the game with these, what they're called NPCs, if you don't know that term, that is a non a uh, player character, so not somebody who is playing the role. It's a uh, it's a quote unquote bot, a robot. It's a, a character, and they have gotten more and more advanced. The way that you treat that, um, if you get in a fight with an NPC in a pub in a medieval game, it can have far-reaching consequences. The entire arc of your narrative, but also to bring it back to appendix and and sort of what we're talking about here, if you wanted to sort of continue on the story a main text, if you will, you can do that and never sort of go down the highways and byways. But if you wanted, quote unquote, to access what might have been in an appendix, if you were reading a book and actually ask a character a, a secondary question or go on what they might, you might hear the term side quests, that's kind of hitting the popular culture with um, social media and so on. It's like, oh, I side quested that. That's all coming from gaming technology where rather than follow the main quest of the story, I don't know, you go off and help a farmer catch a sheep that he lost and it gives you extra money in the game or it does whatever. But these side quests or additional information, I think, are now a much more interactive way to slice and dice what, what would have been a printed appendix into an experience in a game, much like augmented reality to a degree. There is a level of that in these games. Um, these games are not augmented. They're virtual, really, um, these days. But you know what I mean? Like... You, if you looked around in a pub, the game might tell you and indicate to you somehow that, oh, this book that's lying over there on the shelf is one of the books you can read. You can choose to go read that. So it's like bringing the, the appendix forward. Anyway, I think that's, I don't know, just kind of interesting and fascinating that to me that something that evolved way back when to be the last piece, as we, as we talked about, the very first part of the book end matter of a book largely because you had lost the interactivity in two-way street of shared narratives is now coming back um, and, and is much more tangible as an experience and where all the information lives around you in something that isn't separated in another section is where I was going. Um, yeah, I almost, I almost jumped into my big question on, on accident, but that's, that's really, that's my, that's my gig for this. That's great. I, I loved it, Mark, especially since I didn't go that route at all. And it, it was making me think when you were talking about PowerPoint. I mean, who likes PowerPoint? Nobody likes PowerPoint. But I remember back in the day when I used to do a lot of PowerPoint presentations, I definitely always started with a bigger deck than I ended with because I, right, you do the deck and then you end up going, you know what, this information, it's good information, but not everyone necessarily needs to know it. I need to be getting a few points across. So let's put it in the appendix. And I think my appendix always grew larger than the body. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So yeah. you could refer to it, but I somehow needed to get it all in there first and then pare it down. Um, but I love thinking about the oral and two way and how you it really was two, a two way conversation. And you could get all that information without the storyteller having to worry too much about how he was you know, building it in. That was great. Thank you. Absolutely. So. All right. Let's switch well, to your. All right. I'm going to get into the guts of it. Huh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I love that. That was delayed. So I, I, of course, went a very different direction. And as Mark has already taught us, appendix derives from appendary, from the Latin. And as Mark said, it, it, it was very much like a proactive meaning. So to cause to hang on or from something. And that is exactly what our appendix does. It's an organ. It's worm-like in appearance, as Mark has also already taught us. It averages about 3.5 inches in length and just a quarter inch in circumference. So this tiny little worm um, hanging off of our intestine. And the first description of the appendix was reported in 1522 by an Italian anatomist named Berengario de Carpe. And you'd think, or I thought, we might have figured out it existed prior to the Renaissance. I mean, that, that seems pretty late, like in human history to realize that we have this organ. 
But for much of our human history prior to that time, especially during the Greek and Roman empires, human dissection was prohibited. So Herophilus, this was a fourth century BCE physician, and he is known as the father of anatomy. And he got around this dissection prohibition briefly. Um, in fact, he, he's widely believed to be the first to carry out systematic human dissections. We know that the ancient Egyptians would pull out organs for mummification, but he was doing systematic dissections of human bodies to really start to understand how our anatomy worked. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes in the form of vivisections on human prisoners, and vivisections are dissections of live organisms. So it's a, yeah, he, he did some kind of evil things in the pursuit of knowledge, I'd say. Uh, but there was only a 30 to 40 year period during his lifetime where dissections were actually allowed. So Plato, who had, who had lived in the previous century, since Plato, it was thought that the soul inhabited the human body, thus the ban, thus kind of even if the body's dead, it's, you know, sacrosanct and you can't be cutting it up. So they they put that into place. And that lasted until the Renaissance, which I found fascinating, just a really long time in a lot of places. So anyway, he did get to do some dissections, but even though he was able to conduct a few my guess is he was busy discovering much bigger things, right? Like, so he's credited with being the first to describe um, an understanding of female reproductive organs, of cardiovasculature, the nervous system, et cetera. So fast forward about 600 years. So uh, there's a man named Galen. He was a second century common era Roman physician. And it's actually his detailed studies that provide the vast basis of human anatomical understanding up until the Renaissance. He was dissecting animals because of this prohibition on dissecting humans, uh, primarily Barbary apes, which are a type of macaque, and they don't have an appendix. So he knew, he just kind of intuited that there were a lot of things in common, but he wasn't going to find the appendix because it wasn't there in the animals that he was dissecting. In fact, less than 15% of the 361 mammal mammalian species do have an appendix. So it's pretty rare, actually. Um, okay, so Galen, he deeply understood the need to examine actual human cadavers to truly understand, but he couldn't. He did, however, encourage his students to examine bodies like decomposing corpses that may be washed up on shore from a shipwreck or dead gladiators. You know, you can't touch them, but maybe just watch for a while. I'm glad you brought that <laughs> yeah, up. I was but... just gonna ask, I was like, well, what about when, you know, this mysterious soul leaves? Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so he 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 wanted to do it. Like he didn't have any like feelings of not wanting to, but he didn't also wanna be thrown in prison. So that's what he did. So he also like Herophilus was, was busy with larger tasks anyway. Like he documented for the first time, like the entire pulmonary system. Um, so no time for little tiny organs, right? Even if he even if he had seen one. So thus the vermiform appendix, which is its official name, wasn't formally identified until 1522. And the first successful appendectomy didn't happen um, until, sorry, I just lost my place, until 1735. And the surgery was um completed by a Frenchman in London. His name was Claudius Amand. And he he uh, performed the surgery on an 11 year old boy, no antibiotics at the time, no anesthesia. Four grown men had to hold the boy down. He lived, but imagine that horror, just having someone cut into your stomach and remove your appendix, but he lived. So since its discovery, the appendix has mostly been thought of as a fairly useless vestigial organ. Um, even Darwin said, uh, it's just vestigial, it just came to us from somewhere else. But relatively recent research, I'm talking the past like 20 to 40 years, has um, preliminarily pointed to evidence that the appendix may play a pretty big role in our immune response, especially in regards to harboring good gut bacteria. So it's sort of a safe house. So when you have to like reset your good gut bacteria, that's what's happening. The appendix is injecting that. Uh, a lot more study is, is needed for scientists to really understand that, but that's the current thinking. But regardless, for most of us, the appendix is just like, you know, most well known as a pesky organ that you never think about until you develop appendicitis, which if not treated can kill you in pretty short order. In the Middle Ages, and they didn't know what this was, uh, it was called the side sickness. 
so they didn't know why it was happening, but they knew it might kill you. These days, appendicitis affects around seven to nine percent of the population. That's Europe, U.S. and Europe data. Not sure what the global data is, uh, but mortality is below one percent. So it, it's really not not too much of a big deal these days. Interestingly, men have a slightly higher likelihood of developing it. I don't know why, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Okay, so what happens is that the appendix gets inflamed and infected. So this is caused by maybe a buildup of mucus or parasites or fecal matter, and then bacteria really quickly multiply in these mediums. And so the appendix now is swelling up with bacteria. And if it then ruptures, you get peritonitis, which just means an infection of right your, your abdominal cavity, which will kill you if not treated, right, will very quickly lead to sepsis. So getting the appendix out before it ruptures is ideal. How do you know that you need it out? The list of symptoms is very confusing and contradictory. So the most common and recognizable symptom is pain in your lower right abdomen, right? Everyone I think has, has heard that. That's why it was called the side sickness in the middle ages. But also there can be like severe gas and bloating or severe difficulty passing gas. There could be severe constipation or severe diarrhea. <laughs> like, like none of these things are going to lead you to think, you know what, I probably have a problem with my appendix. Oh, it's freaking um, me out because I always assumed it would be like searing pain where you're like, I obviously have to go. I yeah, think if you have so. lower right abdominal pain, then that is like the key thing. But these other things can happen without the pain. So there's also you know, nausea, a mild fever, vomiting, a loss of appetite. But all of those things, right, could be attributable to a virus or, or some lesser yeah. bacterial infection. So that freaked me out a little bit, never having had a appendicitis. I assume you haven't either, Mark. All right. But um, but at least if you do identify it, it can be pretty easily treated. Back in uh in the olden days, however, like ish, like this tiny organ that we don't understand caused all sorts of problems. We don't have mortality rates over the centuries because how would that have been documented accurately, right? They, they wouldn't have known that's what killed somebody. So so we just don't know. But it reminds me a lot of a conversation I had with one of my best friends back in middle school. And it's a, it's a conversation I imagine lots of kids like come to at some point. And that was the realization that we probably wouldn't have survived childhood like back in the days of hunting and gathering. Her eyesight was so bad, even at that young age, that she just assumed she would have been like left in the corner of a cave to die. You know, like she wouldn't have been. <laughs> For real. <laughs> And I had like pretty severe anemia and migraine. So like enough said there, right? Like they're like, I'm just going to be more of a burden. Think about like, if you have a family member with asthma, right? Like, yeah. like all of this. I had not two bouts of what's called peritonsillar abscess before I had my tonsils out. And I didn't know that it comes by another name called Quincy, which is what killed George Washington. Oh, so like, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I had it was such a bad abscess infection that had it ruptured in my neck actually it would have been damn near sepsis level like it was really really serious and i didn't realize that um yeah so i i hear you with that whole like yeah would, would we have made it without my don't know. yeah don't know how we would, would have made it so so there's so many things right that would have made us like less suitable <laughs> for survival but you know on top of that like one burst appendix <laughs> your chances of survival were slim. So if you had the side sickness before the 18th century, here were some of the varied treatments you could look forward to. Oh, great. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's large and repeated bloodlettings. So just make you weaker. Um, laxatives, okay. Like I see that. Like they're like, well, something's going on in there. Maybe let's clean it out. Opiates, at least with the opiates, like they're helping you with the pain, right? So all for it. Uh, my favorite, uh, they would, um, for some period of time, the application to your abdomen of a young, healthy animal split open and then like laid over your stomach. I don't know what it was supposed to do. Maybe draw out the ill humors. Just going to say osmosis. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously none of this. Why are they cutting out the work. demons? I thought for sure, <laughs> I thought for sure there's going to be demons. Exactly. Um, I'm sure there was, right? It just didn't make it into the scientific the scientific literature. So none none of those things. That was if you lived helped. through it. Then they were like, if you lived through it, that means you have demons. <laughs> they protected you, so they kill you anyway. 
Yep. I, I think that probably is um, accurate. So, so none of those things actually uh, helped. Um, so, so here was the deal. If, if you were lucky, your omentum would save you. Mark, do you want to tell the listeners what an omentum is? I, I'm just, I'm just teasing you. I, I know, never wait. knew. <laughs> it's playing off of omen. I'm just kidding. So it's, I don't know. Um, this is so exciting to me because I learned something like I never knew this and it's so exciting. So the omentum is actually a large layer of tissue. Um, it's, it's, it lies on the surface of our abdominal organs. So basically on top of our abdominal organs, and it looks like a tissue. It looks like fat, right? But it acts like an organ. So it has a major role in immune regulation and tissue regeneration. It's known as quote, the policeman of the abdomen. And it, it can, it, it can like um, regulate your hormone levels. And in if in your abdominal cavity, you get an infection, it can actually wrap itself around and isolate areas of infection. It just sounds like an alien yeah. to me, right? right. It is, yeah. I, I never knew we had this. And so that was your best bet as a caveman, like up until the Renaissance. <laughs> it's just- That's fascinating. I, I, it actually makes me think of when you mentioned that the, the rate's a little bit higher in men, I was curious if potentially- hypothesis, um, men more readily have visceral fat put on the abdomen and that visceral fat can act like an organ. It can basically distribute harmful chemicals and things itself. Uh. If visceral fat like, um, is too compounded and too much. So I was just curious if that could be because it's right in that area, maybe it disrupts that type of protection as right. you're mentioning, or it does something right. to the appendix. And yeah. who knows? Like, unfortunately, there's not a ton of research here because again, for so long, scientists are like, ah, this little organ doesn't do anything. And now it mortality is so low. I mean, incidents are so low. And then on top of that, mortality is so low. So it hasn't, they don't, they just don't worry about it that much. Um, okay, but but we're not back in the olden days anymore. We do have a medical treatment, assuming the problem is identified. So, you know, no, no, don't fret anyone. Um, but even so, even today, even though, you know, pretty low occurrence, as I said, and, and very low mortality, people in certain professions are required to have their appendix removed, even if it's like 100% healthy and, and playing nice. Pilots. It, any guesses, Mark? Pilots. No, it's a great guess, though, and it's kind of close. You want to take another guess? Kind of close to pilots who can't suddenly drop dead. <laughs> All I can think of is pilots. <laughs> but pilots <sighs> always have a co-pilot, right? So oh right. Uh train engineers? No, they no, but see. you're definitely th you were thinking the right way. Astronauts. Ah. Because if that happens in space, man, and you are just out, out of luck. For so long. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Usually. you're out of luck. Also, doctors who go on expeditions um, to Antarctica or the Arctic on research missions, not everyone has to have it because there's always a doctor on staff with scientific research missions, but the doctor, him or herself, will have to have their appendix removed beforehand because if if, if there's ruptures, no one can save them. And um, and then there's no doctor. So that was that was really interesting to me. And and the other th one I came across was residents of this little tiny town called um, Villas Las Estrellas. It's Hamlet of the Stars in Spanish. It's a Chilean settlement in Antarctica. So most um, quote unquote settlements in Antarctica are, are research stations where people come and go. Right. Scientists go and stay for a matter of months and they leave. This is an actual settlement of about 100 people. And it's mostly researchers and then Chilean military, but a lot of them bring their families and stay for years at a time. And I found some really cool pictures that we'll put in the show notes. Um, but the nearest hospital is 600 miles away. So let's say you're serving in the military and you want to bring your family, even your children would have to have their appendix removed because there's just basically no hope. So, so this got me thinking about all the past and current explorers who set off for months right? On adventures of daring do. Um, maybe they should have their appendixes removed as well. Or like right? how many did die stranded somewhere of appendicitis? We wouldn't know. Right. Yeah. So maybe there is some record. Right. Well, uh, it's very, it's very uh, perfect that you said that because I mean, elective surgery is always a risk. Of course, any type of elective, sur elective surgery, 
But in my mind, is that as big a risk as potentially dying in the Himalayas because you can't get to a hospital, for instance? Um, but then I thought, you know, I imagine these folks like NIMS we talked about in our episode on height, right? They know they can meet death at any minute doing what they do, right? They're doing some some pretty crazy things like mountaineers, for instance. But but they kind of believe that their mental and their physical training it's going to help them survive these challenges and dangers that they know they're going to face. But our little friend inside of us can get nasty at any minute, right? There's no amount of training. So it kind of got me thinking just what you said, Mark. I thought, I wonder if there are stories about adventurers, you know, dying due to appendicitis or requiring, you know, insanely massive research, uh, research, rescue efforts. Um, So I started down that path, but before I came across any, I came across the story of a man named Tom Cream. And it was so interesting, I stopped right there. And this is how I'm gonna wrap up. So Crean was an Antarctic explorer and he was born in 1877 in rural Ireland. And he was on both Robert Falcon Scott's and Ernest Shackleton's expeditions in Antarctica. And this is how it happened. He left home at 15 years old and joined the British Royal Navy. And he happened to be in New Zealand with the British Royal Navy when, it's just so interesting, um, when Scott was about to depart for an Antarctic expedition. And he suddenly, Scott suddenly needed another man because one of his men like punched a petty officer (laughs) and gets thrown in jail. So now Scott is down a man. And Crean, he's never, you know, He's never been to Antarctica. He just volunteers. So I'll, I'll go. He proved so competent that Scott asked him to join him on his next expedition. Interestingly, on Scott's first expedition, Shackleton was also a member, which I hadn't known. And I'll talk a little bit more about these men. But, you know, if you've heard about Robert Falcon Scott, it's probably because you've you know read about the race to be the first human to reach the South Pole. And so you also had Roald Amundsen, who was an Antarctic explorer. So in 1911, you had an expedition led by Scott and you had an expedition led by Amundsen. And they're both just racing to be the first to get there. That was the second Scott expedition that Crean went on. So he was so amazing on the first one that Scott asked him to join all his subsequent ones. They were, so as they're going along, they get to very, very close to the pole and and Scott has to cut his team down to just a handful of men because, you know, there's not enough rations, like gotten it this far. Now we have to send like the other folks back, make sure they're stocking up the um, the base camp and, and they go on. Crean, he wasn't cut, like he didn't do anything wrong, but basically he wasn't chosen for the final push with Scott to the South Pole. And he was devastated because they were so close and he was so valued. So he was kind of like, what? Well, like, why am I not being, not WTF. being chosen? Yeah. Exactly. I think that's exactly what he said. But, uh, you know, kind of good for Crean because Scott's entire polar expedition died. So I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm like, yeah. whose appendix exploded? Exactly. What happened? <laughs> they all died, as far as we know, not from appendicitis, from exposure and starvation and all of that. Uh, but Crean now has to <clears throat> trek back with, with another handful of men. He survived the trek back to base camp. Along the way, he just like completed these like heroic feats to save the men he was with, one of whom came down with snow blindness and scurvy on the return and thus had to be like pulled on a sledge all the way back. So now they have barely anything to eat. They're already exhausted. And now they have to like, basically they have a passenger. All of this was done on like a chocolate bar and a couple of biscuits between them all. Just absolutely like mind blowing feats. Clearly no oranges. Yeah, exactly. So three years later, In 1914, Crean went again to the Antarctic on Ernest Shackleton's endurance expedition. And if you haven't read about the endurance or watched, there's there's so many excellent documentaries on it. I I highly recommend you do. It is such an inspiring story. But long story short, um, Shackleton's ship, the endurance, was ice locked and eventually crushed by the ice flows. And his crew drifted on ice flows for 492 days. They ate their ponies, they ate their dogs, they ate their shoe leather. 
I mean, they kept hoping that the currents would bring them around to solid land and maybe a whaling station, but it didn't. So they survived for over a year living out on exposed ice, um, which, you know, that alone is mind blowing. And eventually Shackleton decides they had to make a a last ditch effort and they were all going to die out there. They had to take one of the lifeboats that they had that they had salvaged before the ship uh, went down to try to effect a rescue. And so he was going to send this lifeboat out into Antarctic swells to try to get to South Georgia Island. And Crean, Tom Crean, was chosen to be a member of this small crew. They sailed 800 nautical miles. It's about 1,500 kilometers. Uh, the, the a polar historian named Carolyn Alexander um you know, it says it's one of the most extraordinary feats of seamanship and navigation in recorded history. And we talked a lot about naval navigation last episode with maps. It took 17 days through gales and snow squalls in rough seas. And the navigator, the official navigator, Frank Worsley, described it as mountainous westerly swells. So they're in a lifeboat. Remember, they're not in a, a ship. Uh, so it's a miracle they survived. They had the barest of navigational equipment, but they made it. They made it to South Georgia Island. I mean, that navigator, I think, probably deserves, <laughs> I right? I keep waiting for when the appendix is going to burst. I, I know. I love it. You're on the edge I'm of like, your seat. Oh, like, when wait, is somebody what? dying? <laughs> so I promise we're almost there. So, so they make it. But once, <laughs> so once they land, though, they're on the wrong side of the island because the currents couldn't get them to the side of the island that had the the inhabited whaling station. So somebody has to do a 30 mile trek over mountains to get to the whaling station to get help. Well, guess who? Crean, Tom Crean does this. They haven't slept in, you know, weeks. They have barely any food. And uh, Crean and a couple others trekked for 36 hours over glaciers and mountains. It is the first recorded crossing of South Georgia Island, which is a, just a completely mountainous island. It was completed without tents, without sleeping bags, without a map. They just figured it out. Their only mountaineering equipment was a carpenter's ads, a length of rope, and screws that they'd saved from the ship hammered in their boots to serve as crampons. So talk about feats of daring do. So and then pop, spoiler alert goes the end. <laughs> they, they get help, they go rescue all the other men. And um Shackleton didn't lose one man. Just just side note. This is not where the where the appendix comes in. Uh, a lot of a lot uh, past decade, maybe there have been a lot of um, writings on kind of his leadership style that have just been talked about as like some of the best leadership that you could emulate. Okay, so after this expedition, Tom Crean retires from Antarctic exploration, probably understandably, right, having been on two of. Uh, the most terrifying Antarctic oh, expeditions in history. And he moves back to his small town of Anaskal and he gets married and he opens a pub and he calls the pub the South Pole Inn. And people, the South Pole Inn still exists in Anaskal, Ireland. And you know, I am now putting that high on my list of destinations. So as I said, he settles down, he gets married, he has three daughters and he just settles into this quiet life. And he never talks about his experience in the Antarctic, except to his children. By all accounts, he was like the most humble, kind, mild mannered man. He was this giant of a man, like physically gentle giant, very handsome too, Mark. You'll be interested to hear. I'll, I'll <laughs> post a picture. Uh, but in 1938, at the dun, age of 61, dun, dun. His appendix burst. He was taken to Trelly Hospital, but there was no surgeon available. So he was transferred to Cork and his appendix was removed, but it was too late because of the delay and infection had set in and he died a week later. And thus this mighty man who had achieved amazing physical and mental feats never before achieved before him was laid low by the vermiform appendix living a quiet life. And a very quick side note, I would love to tell this whole story, but I had to pick one in the interest of time. It seems as if the great Harry Houdini also died of a ruptured appendix. And there are those for, for a very long time, his death has been attributed. You know, he would let anyone punch him in the stomach. It was one of his tricks as hard as they could, because he would tighten his abdominal muscles and no one could hurt him. And 
a young man did that to him twice. I mean, Houdini had had, uh, you know, given him the permission to do it, but he hadn't had time to tighten up his abdomen before the punches hit. So he was like very, very kind of traumatized the area. Um, A day later, I think uh, his appendix burst. And for a very long time, people said, well, of course it burst because it sustained the trauma from where he was hit by this young man. Uh, But there is no evidence to this day linking trauma to the abdominal area and a burst appendix. So it is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is, you know, 99% um, for sure that that was just a coincidence. So that is two greats brought down by this little worm. These men who had done all these other amazing things, you know, Harry Houdini had had um, performed so many amazing physical acts. So as I said in the beginning, I have a new respect for our vermiform appendix. 1938, I think the appendix just sensed that the world was going to shit. It was like, we're going to check out. <laughs> Maybe it just has that sense. No one's tested that theory. Um, like wow, it, that Mark. was fantastic. Once again, I mean, I'm so impressed with like the, the depth and the, uh, that's fascinating. I thought so too. I was so thrilled to, to, to stumble upon, uh, across Crean, who, whom I'd never heard of. And in fact, I immediately, um, what's apt some Irish friends, Mark knows and said, the pub. I said, next time I'm in Ireland, this is a road trip. I, I don't care what you're doing. Two of them have already been there. And I was uh. like, you've been there and you never told me that this man existed. And the, uh, the third said, Oh yeah, the, he's a bit of a legend in this part of the world. And I also was like, how long have you known me? Like, wh- right, how, come on. how have I not been told about him? Uh, there's a book about him. <laughs> exactly. There's a book written about Tom Crean, uh, called an unsung hero, which I didn't have time to read, but it's on my reading list now. And I certainly will be reading it. So yeah, I, I didn't think appendix was necessarily going to be that interesting, but I got to say, I really, I learned so much from all about the momentum to all about yeah. this Irish explorer. So no, you fantastic. Go. You know, it, it makes me think, I wonder how long it takes for the problem to develop before it bursts, mm-hmm. because Say it was, I don't know, say it, does it slowly happen, start and take a year? Can it quickly swell? Because part of me thinks, why aren't we doing standard two minute ultrasounds of that area to see if it's damaged or something? So it's not a surprise. That's a great question. You know what I mean? Like, but that, well, I problem. here's where our American healthcare system and insurance and everything else, it's probably expensive. And WAS, we don't do this preventative stuff because it's expensive. Meanwhile, like it's the same reason why we why don't we do full body like cancer uh, screenings and everything else. Anyway, I agree. Once, I, I had once a- had my physician be like, oh. "Well, they do that in Europe. We don't really do that in the states." I'm like, "What the hell?" <laughs> anyway, I, cut I, you off I quite I, no, I I quite literally had a, a unrelated to this topic. I had a little personal rant on that the other day, actually, to my mother about how they won't do cancer screenings. Um, I, I guess with the appendix, because the incidents are so low and the mortality that that makes sense. But to me, like cancer just lays everybody low. So why wouldn't right. they do that? Right. Well, I mean, I know why, because <laughs> the insurance companies want to save money. But uh, OK, but that is that is not that is not what we're here to talk about. Right. So I think I think that you probably have a big question. Big teed question. Up. I do. I do. So my big question is, and I, I think I teased this up a bit in my rabbit hole with the evolution of generative AI, right? This AI that, that literally can create interactive storytelling that is completely unique each time there is a different input or each time there's a different user interacting with it. Anyone who's out there using chat GPT and that there's a lot of AI happening right now uh, in the, the, the zeitgeist, if you will. Um, is it possible that stories as we know them now will actually only exist as themes, not as plots? Will specifics of those plots, sequences, outcomes, even settings, become fluid and always generated in partnership with the user, such that you're putting the th- the, the emphasis on the, the theme, as I mentioned, a, a love story where X, Y, Z may happen, and therefore the inputs, the, the, the actual, it's not even a telling of a story, really the enactment of a story 
between generative AI and the user, the quote unquote, you can't say reader anymore, the, the user, the experiencer plays out and is therefore not locked in. It is almost a bit like oral history because it would be a bit more adaptive, much more adaptive. Um, so I, I, that's one of my questions. You know, it's kind of going out there on a limb with a question, but as the, the nature of big questions yeah. could potentially, as these things happen, say a thousand years from now, if we don't destroy ourselves, and um, will books even be needed? Will the the idea of of stories be experiences that revolve around a theme? I guess I don't know. I keep saying that, but that's really kind of where I meant to go. Um, and if that's true, you know, what would that mean for tales used to teach or advise, such as fables, right? Such as things that are meant to, you know, teach children certain things. But that may be good or bad because maybe then they're more relevant. Maybe they're more um, impactful and unique to the experiencer versus something that is dictated. That's my big question. That is so interesting. I I mean, I would just be devastated if books became a thing of the past, but I know part of that is just traditionalism. Um, but I think it's such an interesting question because there's so many conversations about AI, especially right now, right? With Hinton having come out and said that he thinks, you know, we're going to have a big yeah. problem with it, with the, you know, godfather of AI coming out and saying that and leaving Google. And those conversations are really, really rocketing to the forefront right now. Um, but there is right potential good and there is potential interesting stuff. And I think what you said, that is so interesting that like now stories can become interactive again um, and become part of an experience, which I guess that would be another thing you could argue either way, like how amazing, right? Someone who loves to read love stories that you could be involved in the story as it goes, like a choose your own adventure, except like <laughs> you've totally really yeah. upped the technology. Um versus how much does that like again pull people away from real life and real interaction right so all the yeah. arguments that people make today about social media this isn't exactly where you were going but what you were saying also made me think so there's a writer strike of course currently mm -hmm. going on in hollywood and one of the big um, issues that they're raising is the use of AI to generate scripts for screenplays. And I heard a, some really interesting interviews with some of the writers who were striking, who were saying, sure, like AI is great. It's a great research tool when you need to understand you're writing a scene and you really need to understand the details of uh, the example that uh, one man Even used. Even that was, though is difficult. Like I, I will say it, it can hallucinate anyone not familiar with the term AI can hallucinate things that are plausible but not real. Mm. If you ask for a reference sometimes of chat GPT, it will give you down to a URL and a title of a paper, but it's generating something that is plausibly the name of an academic paper written by plausibly somebody who may have written in the space, but they never actually wrote it. Because now you have people out there in the academic space, academics being like, I never wrote this paper. I never wrote this. Like I never did that. Right. And it's, it's, crazy yeah it's, that, it's that really i didn't know that that's it. and this guy said too he said look if i need to understand his example was i need to understand more about how a certain governmental agency works he said i can ask ai he goes but i have to ask it i think to your point he's like yeah, you he's, have like, to vet it. he's like i have to ask it specifically i have to ask it in multiple ways I have to like literally ask it to do a deep dive, you know, yes. I, all these things. So that was interesting. So he was saying, look, I don't think it's, it's evil. It's a great tool, but studios have started to lean on like going directly to that, which is, I think a little bit terrifying that we're the human creativity piece will be taken out of the art that we, I mean, not that I'd call every TV show and movie art, but you know what I mean? That, right. that, you know, the stories we consume. So yeah. Ooh. So It'll be it's, interesting it's, you know, to your point where you said, will, will books disappear? Um, I mean, potentially books could also evolve to be interactive. It's, th there's also a spectrum. Um, those not familiar, there's generative AI, there's predictive AI, kind of the difference between AI and machine learning. Machine learning is more like intense number crunching and, and predictive models used on data, et cetera. That's been around for a while. Um, but there are ways to sort of limit the scope of how open-ended and generative an AI can be. It's called um, 
if I'm not butchering this, uh, the domains that you use. So, so some generative AI can be what's called open domain, meaning they can say and pull from any bank of information and completely make permutations and combinations of that information to respond to the user in any way that it, it sees fit. But you can also train on what's called single domain or closed domain perhaps, where that might mean that the only responses it can have are within a set number, like set parameters. Say for example, you could uh, uh, say they take the constitution and provide only the constitution to a particular AI program. And therefore everything that responds, it could literally just give back responses that are word for word parts of mm. the constitution, for example. Um, just to make the point of there, there are, it's going to be fascinating, scary, but fascinating, potentially great if we can figure out how to size it, so to speak, how to, to, yeah. to, hone in on what we would benefit from because i could see right in my question for example if you took away you just focused on the theme the the craft could be deciding on the experiences and the themes and the, the dramatic conflict and questions that going through an experience of this type might raise it's kind of like writing a play the central dramatic question is one that is very difficult, kind of a big question unto itself, usually, right? Um, and you're very detailed in how you focus this generative AI to explore that, then you can trust that it's not going to be too far off of the, the creator's intent. So you still have like an artist of some kind creating something. But yeah, I don't, sorry, yeah. I ramble on, but it's it's a lot. It's a lot. To no, process. it's a lot. It's I, that was such a great big question because it is once again we can't <laughs> answer it, and it's so relevant to right now with AI and the writer strike and all those things. It is just so relevant. So but anyway, I well, want to take away. Well, uh, how about, how about you? well done? Uh, I, I'll do mine. I'll do mine, and then we'll wrap. But you made me think of something else. I'll just throw in. and We'll put this in the um, in the show notes and on the blog on the website. I saw a show last night that I'll just mention. It was super fun. Um, it's not going to win any you know, like Tony's or Pulitzer's, but it's called uh, Once Upon a One More Time. So it's basically a number of fairy tale princesses. So Cinderella, you know, Little Mermaid, just think all our Snow White, of course, you know, all, Sleeping Beauty, all, all our, our main fairy tale princesses. And there's a narrator and they end up one of Cinderella, who, who was kind of the main princesses, ends up getting her hands on a copy of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique and wants to change her story, starts to realize how problematic these fairy tales we've all grown up with are in terms of the roles for women. It's very funny. It's just a lot of fun. It is very and it's all Britney Sounds Spears awesome. songs. It's all oh, Britney. Uh, that's why it's called Once Upon a One More Time. And it's just fun and silly and amazing dancing and singing. And, and also like this great story, especially for young girls who go to see it about, you can change your story. And at the end, the beginning and the end, there's a little girl who's the reader and she comes on and they're like, the narrator keeps saying, we can't change the story. We can't change the story. And then the little girl's like, I love this new story. So this idea about narratives changing and the way readers interact with a story Less high tech, more fantasy in this case. But I just thought I'd throw that in if anyone enjoys um, Broadway and silliness. And oh, I love it. Also, if you Spears. haven't seen mm -hmm. And Juliet, you might oh, I haven't seen want it to yet. see that as well because it's it's a similar type of thing around what if Juliet took a different ah, I love approach it. to her I'm noting that. and everything else. <laughs> yeah. I'm noting that it. here. Okay, uh, I will I'll throw out my big question just and then we will wrap up. So so I'm going back to like my musings on surviving childhood and caveman date. Obviously this affected me. I still remember the conversation from middle school. So obviously my ancestors somehow were hardy enough, right? Because I'm here, like the line survived. Um, so it just got me thinking, are many of our problems now a result of better medicine that gets us through childhood like undead? Is asthma more common thanks to pollution? Because we've like created it more, but we can survive asthma now because then we also have pharmaceutical companies creating inhalers. Is fitness impacted because we're not physically active, like trying to actually like 
grow our food and or hunt our food? You know, should we to some degree be trying to go backward instead of forward? And I know, of course, there are like survivalists and like preppers out there who will say, absolutely, we should be going like kind of back to older technologies. Um, and then there are folks who say no technology is the answer to anything. So with all our big questions, I don't think there's one answer, but I was interested in your thoughts on that, Mark. Ooh, it's a uh, well done as a <laughs> big question. I mm -hmm. I wrap my head around it as a a question of of dependence. You know, we we create these things to better and elongate our to better our health, to elongate our life expectancy. But to your point, in doing that, this whole idea of if it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Well, we sidestep that. So we're no longer stronger and therefore we're getting quote unquote weak, more and more vulnerable. I guess the question becomes the risk of if something were to go wrong or that we lose what kind of becomes an arms race, right? I, in my head, it's like you have to maintain kind of like antibiotics. Our antibiotics have been helping us, but now we don't really fight things off maybe as well as we should, right. but also the antibiotics are being outrun by the evolution of the bacteria. Yeah. And else. There's just a lot of things, right? Um, I I do though, err on this, or not err, I, I sort of lean towards the point of if you are somebody alive, alive, and you didn't ask to be born and you're here, society should be continuing to do whatever we can to not have those people suffer and die off. We're not like a Lord of the Flies society anymore, where if you can't make it, like you said before, Allison, your friend who was like, I would have been left in the corner of the cave because I couldn't see. We can't do that. We can't treat each other that way. That's, that's horrifying. Um, that being said, do we have an over-reliance on the biomedical versus... I don't even know what this is, I mean, but we do because I don't even have a term for it. Would it be through exercise and exposure therapies or things that are safe um, exposure? I mean, I think there are a lot of ways to treat even allergies, right? That are, you have to kind of live through it, exposure mm. therapy to then build a resistance. I don't think people go through that anymore because we just rely on a drug. So yeah, I think it's a combination. I think we're doing the right thing or doing the obvious thing to sort of maintain a quality of of existence for for humanity so we're not left as a child in the cave but um but this may be more we can do to balance our yeah no i think habits. you hit it i think as <laughs> usual it's right it's somewhere in the middle i'll throw in a fact uh, that I learned quite recently. I, I've always been a little bit, even pre-pandemic, a, a little bit worried about our overuse of antibacterial soap and cleansers and all that because the bacteria are winning, folks. Like we have a lot of For things real. right, a lot of infections right now that antibiotics that. are not, yeah, are not keeping up with. And I'm convinced we're all going to die from um, MDR TB, which is multi-drug resistance resistant TB. So just I'll throw that little uh, <laughs> optimistic nugget in there for you. But, you know, but using like- fatalistic. And uh, right, Steve, I'm not fatalistic. Uh, using antibacterial wipes on everything, which really then uh, skyrocketed, of course, during the pandemic. And I understand why. There was a study done. Uh, I'll see if I can find where I had read about it a couple of years ago in a hospital where they're dealing with some of these infections, right? That mm, like don't get them because antibiotics aren't going to save you anymore. And they do, you know, absolute floor to ceiling cleaning, right? With bleach and antibiotic wipes. Uh, and studies have shown that doing that versus just opening all the windows for an hour, opening all the windows in your home for an hour reduces the bacterial load more than wiping down with antibacterial wipes. So, right, talk about old school, like, you know, when people would air their house out every, you know, like gotta yeah. get the good air in it. They didn't understand why, but it actually has an effect. So there's my PSA for people just doing some things the old fashioned way. All right. Should we Don't generate in now? <laughs> should we should we generate our new noun, Mark? Let's do it. Okay. Drum roll, please. Our new noun. Wow. Uh -oh. Our new noun is alcohol. <laughs> Let's bring it on. 
<laughs> I thought you might <laughs> you might get a little excited about that one. Um, okay, so any final thoughts? Oh, we have to rate it, and we didn't. I'm so sorry, yeah, we didn't no, revisit course, our ratings. I so have the ratings here. Yeah, um, go for it. So you, Allison, gave Appendix a six. How are you feeling now? Oh, I'm going up to an eight point five. I absolutely Ooh, loved yes, it. I learned love so it. much, and I thought it was so interesting. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I gave it a three. I am going to bring that to a six. Not knocking it out of the park, but I enjoyed it um, and surprised myself with a connection to to narrative. Cool. Excellent. Right. And how are you feeling about alcohol? Oh, let's do. Gosh, there's so many things, places to go with it from just the biochemical nature to its societal impacts to blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's throw out an eight. Oh, eight. wow. Okay. Mark's going high. I am. Gah. I'm going <laughs> to. <Yeah. laughs> I'm going to throw out a mm, seven, seven, just do seven. All right. Just thinking of a six, but we're going to do seven. Okay. Love it. All right. I think with that, if you want to take us on out. Yes, absolutely. So uh, just as usual, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We still love doing this. We're learning something new every episode, as I think we demonstrated today. And I hope that you all are, too, and that you're inspired uh, to be more curious. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please uh, follow, subscribe on whatever platform that you use for your podcasts. If you feel inclined to leave us a rating, it really helps us understand how we're doing as well as helps other people find the show. And you can visit us on the web at renownedpodcast.com or on social media at Renowned Podcast. And with that, we wish you well until the next episode. Take care, everyone.